Gentlemen, the Committee on Energy, Utilities, Environment, and Climate will please come to order. It's Wednesday, March 27th at 1230 p.m. We are in room 1150 of the Minnesota Senate Building, and a quorum <clears throat> is present. Um, members, ladies and gentlemen, all the bills we're going to hear today will be laid over. We're going to start with uh, Senator Rest on Senate file 4863. Senator Rest, welcome to the committee. I understand you have an author's amendment. Um, yes, Mr. Chairman, I do. Um, Senator Mitchell moves the A2 amendment. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? The A2 amendment is adopted. Senator Rest to your bill as amended. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> First of all, I would like to um, um, thank the um, Senate Council for um, helping me and, um, uh, and my constituent with um, addressing the issues that weren't in the bill as, um, as introduced. And um, uh, it's been, their help has been um, invaluable in producing the DE amendment. Um, it does address the um, renewable development account that is under the jurisdiction of this committee. And just a little bit of background on it, just for the uh, public consumption. Uh, it was created in 1984 by the legislature and requires uh, XL Energy to set aside money for renewable energy grants in exchange for storing uh, nuclear waste at Prairie Island and um, in Monticello. Um, the, when it was first enacted, the money was not transferred to the state. Um, XL was required in statute to operate a renewable energy uh, grant program using the money. In 2017, the law was uh, modified and, had the, and the money was transferred now into a state account and then various projects and grants have been funded from uh, the RDA um, over, um, over the years by appropriations from the legislature. It is not a general fund um, expenditure. Um, as of now, the RDA receives about $28 million per year from XL Energy. And <clears throat> um, in, the, uh, in the current year, uh, they will deposit about $51 million into the um, RDA, uh, and um, it's going up at, even after that. In 2023, the legislature appropriated $80.8 million from the RDA for the 24-25 um, biennium. Um, almost all of these appropriations are, um, are one time. And currently, according to the February forecast, there is currently a $19 million fund balance in the RDA for FY 2025. The um, DE amendment starting at the top and uh, subdivision one um, uh, creates a, um, a program uh, in the Department of Commerce to provide financial assistance to developers and producers of ultra-efficient electric vehicles that use a proprietary um, technology, meaning um, owned by uh, a private company or individual. Uh, Subdivision 2 sets forward the application uh, process to the uh, Commissioner of, uh, of Commerce. Um, who is then to receive and then review those grant applications um, and awarding them under, under subdivision two, um, also requiring the commissioner to set up the administration and uh, administration of the applications and evaluations and the grant, grant award process. The <clears throat> subdivision three states the um, maximum amount of any grant um, uh, awarded under this program as being uh, $250,000 um, uh, um, with some stipulations for what the, um, what the <clears throat> commissioner must consider in, um, in the process, namely that um, priority will be given to electric vehicle projects that are deemed to be near um, production 
ready. This is not. This is not a. Uh, 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 this is something that can be done, uh, uh, very much in the near future, and that um, the commissioner must give priority to electric vehicle projects that are ultra efficient, and we'll hear from my witness um, about how his project. Um, uh, fits into that category. And then in subdivision four, there is a, um, a grant account that is established in a uh, special revenue fund, which is commonly um, done in the state, um, or at least it's not unusual, uh, in the special, uh, as, as a special revenue fund in the state um, treasury. And, um, uh, and, um, uh, there is um, the um, there is the requirement that if the funds in the account are not um, uh, are not um, expended um, by June 30th of 2028, the um, the um, uh, the money um, the leftover money um, reverts. And so um, the appropriations can only be used for the purpose that is outlined in, in um, subdivision five. And then um, there are two um, reports that are required, January 15th of 2026, and then uh, three years later, 2029, to send a uh, report to the uh, committees including the one that we are in right now, those chairs, and um, the um, uh, $250,000 would be appropriated um, for um, to the Commissioner of Commerce, again, for an ultra-electric efficient vehicle development grant program. So, um, Mr. Chairman, that is the... Um, that is the... Um, Explanation of the DE, which is which is actually um, the bill, and at the end, um, in the last subdivision, there is a reference to 10C, 116C, um, uh, 779, which is the which is the description in statutes of the um, renewable development ac account. Thank you very much, Senator Rest. Uh, the Proposal had some uh, great discussion before we got here. It's innovative, and I understand you have a testifier. Am I pronouncing it correctly, Mr. Kronfeld? Yeah, you, that works. Uh, well, please introduce yourself uh, and present your testimony. My name is uh, Richard Kronfeld, or Kronfeld. Um, Mr. Chair and committee members, um, I'm the founder of the Kronfeld Motor Company, a Golden Valley-based startup focused on ultra-high-efficiency electric mobility technology. Thank you very much, Senator Rest, for authoring SF4863. I'd just like to make three brief points. Uh, number one, uh, innovative Minnesota companies competing for grants to spur the growth of the industry. Kronfeld Motor Company is developing cutting-edge electric vehicle technology here in Minnesota. By supporting this policy change of allowable uses of this grant pool, you'll be fostering homegrown innovation. It will enable our company to build on what we've already accomplished with the help of the Department of Commerce, Mankato State <laughs> University, and others to invest in emerging technology that will reshape the motor vehicle industry and help the state meet its goals of being carbon neutral. Number two, create good Minnesota jobs. If my company were to be awarded this expanded grant, it would empower Kronfeld Motor to expand its operations, creating high-skilled jobs in Minnesota's clean technology sector, growing our state's workforce by pushing into the EV tech space. And number three, drive Minnesota's economic growth. The expanded grant pool will position Minnesota to be more competitive with Georgia, Texas, Michigan, and other states in the electric vehicle revolution. Minnesota has actually been in the vehicle business for a very long time. We're not just a med tech state, we're a mobility tech state, starting with Ford factories, both in St. Paul and Minneapolis, and then homegrown Polaris and Articat. 
What Kronfeld Motor Company is building is a new chapter in the automotive legacy of our state. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Rest. I would be happy to answer any questions the committee has. Thank you, Mr. Kronfeld. Senator Rest. And Mr. Chairman, I would just call members' attention to the, um, the handout that is in your packet so that you can see, um, you can see a, um, uh, first of all, a, um, a photo of the, um, um, of the prototype, which has already been built, and then um, it, it expands on the, um, the comments made by, uh, by Mr. Kronfeld about his company and what is happening in the country um, with regard to um, electric vehicle uh, development and manufacturing and with the emphasis on, um, uh, on vehicles that are um, high speed and also ultra efficient. And he certainly can respond to any questions about what that means according to um, um, the hypercycle, which is what he's calling his vehicle. Thank you, Senator Rest. Members, you do in fact have in your packet uh, the material. Also, there's a website with additional information available on Cronfeld Motors. Before we go to member questions, are there any members of the public who wanted to come forth and testify on this bill? All right, seeing none, we're going to go to member questions. Senator Rarick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, looking at this, is this meant to be just a one-time um, appropriation into this account, um, or is this potentially supposed to be um, to have multiple grants? Mm -hmm. Senator Rest. That's my understanding, Mr. Chairman, thank Senator you. Rarick. Thank you, Senator Rest. Senator Rarick, any follow-up? Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess uh, wondering why we're creating a, an entirely new kind of account um, when, if we're trying to identify this one company, why wouldn't we just appropriate the money uh, to the company instead of creating this program and having reports and, and everything like that be required? Fair question, Senator Ms. Rarick. Senator <coughs> Rest. Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Minnesota innovators are all over the place. We have one with us here in this committee. That doesn't mean that there aren't others. Um, and if they have ultra-efficient uh, uh, EVs, then certainly um, they are uh, eligible um, as well. I will be um, cheering on Mr. Kronfeld. Um, in in this process, but um, in my mind, that's why it's um, it's best not to just say um, give it to this man or give it to this woman or this person, um, but describes what has to happen, what kind of, of efficiencies uh, are needed uh, <clears throat> to uh, to qualify for the Commissioner of Commerce's consideration. Thank you, Senator Rest. Senator Rarick, any follow-up? One quick follow-up, Mr. Chair. Um, do we have, then, a definition of what the ultra-high efficiency uh, would be uh, for the commissioner if we're going to create this program so we would have that parameter established? Thank you, Senator Rarick. Either Senator Rest or Mr. Kronfeld, definition of ultra-efficiency. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and Senator. Um, I don't have a specific definition. My vehicle uh, uses a pedal generation system, and it's extremely aerodynamic. And there's other technologies that we've patented uh, to uh, regain as much power as possible and put it back into the overall system. There, there are other companies that there's a company called Aptera. I think they're out of California. And they're also working on an ultra-high efficiency vehicle. Uh, they use some different technology than I do. But no, there, there's no formal uh, rules or numbers put in place. Thank you, Mr. Kronfeld. Senator Rarick. All right. We'll go to Senator Dibble and then Senator Lucero. Senator Dibble. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, probably a, a question more appropriate for the Transportation Committee. 
um, I'm, I'm supportive of advancing this technology. I think it's uh, really fascinating, especially the um, ideas around using a lot less energy for um, the you know propulsion that's that's necessary. Um, so that's that's really cool. Um, to just uh, just confirming or just asking, um, th this vehicle has met all the various uh, criteria um, to be defined as a particular type of vehicle within the structure of the Department of Public Safety and Department of Transportation statutes. Is it classified as a particular kind of vehicle and and deemed to be roadworthy, et cetera? Uh, Mr. Chairman and Senator Dibble, uh, yes, it has. And I'll, I'll, I'm going to <clears throat> ask uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Kronfeld, to um, explain the uniqueness of, um, of the system that he is proposing and why it met um, uh, uh, no uh, pushback, if you will, from the Department of Public Safety. Thank you, Senator Rest. Thank you, Senator Dibble. Mr. Kronfeld, I think the question is, has it met all those? But if you want to expand a little bit into uniqueness, I think that's fine. <clears throat> Mr. Kronfeld. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Senator. Um, the, the vehicle as uh, designed currently is, dis is categorized by uh, the Minnesota Department of Transportation as a motorcycle. It's a three-wheel vehicle, um, and it, it meets all the requirements that uh, a motorcycle would have to meet in terms of safety, headlights, taillights, brakes, et cetera, except it, it adds on the features of having a, a fiberglass body, seat belts, and a steering wheel. So it's, it, it, this, this is kind of a, a new sort of gray area in terms of uh, the automotive uh, categorizations of things because it's, uh, uh, it's, it's in between you know, a four-wheel car and, and a motorcycle, although it's much safer than a motorcycle. Um, uh, and then, as, as I mentioned, the, the uniqueness of it is the, the pedal generation system. It, it allows you to pedal a, as you would a bicycle at highway speeds. It's intended for use on highways and roadways, not bike paths because you'd plow people over. Um, and uh, our, our patents are in, in the way the, the pedal generation system is, is managed by using a, a concept of dynamic regeneration uh, like when you when you break when you put your foot on the brake of an electric car, there's a regenerative aspect. I'm sorry, probably going on too long here, but there's a regenerative aspect to the braking system using the motor to to brake the vehicle. In, in our vehicle, the regeneration system is is dynamic, and it can be uh, the, the software adjusts it up and down to to simulate uh, pedal resistance, like on a bicycle. Thank you, Mr. Kronfeld. Senator Dibble. Senator Dibble's good. We're going to go to Senator Lucero, then I believe Senator <laughs> Grunhagen, then Senator Green. Is that right? We'll go to, I know we're going to Senator Lucero. <clears throat> Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, so as I was listening to the testimony here, you had likened this to a motorcycle. Is a motorcycle license required then to operate this? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Senator, uh, the answer to that is, is no. Uh, because there have been a couple other vehicles similar to this that have been developed, I think that there's been some changes and developments in, in the laws. So even though it's categorized as a motorcycle, you don't need a, a motorcycle endorsement on your license to drive it. And that's true in uh, the continental United States and most of the uh, provinces of Canada currently. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and then you had mentioned something about a pedal propulsion system. Is there, is it not battery operated then? Is that, is the pedal the sole means of propulsion or is it, how does this thing running? <clears throat> Mr. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator. Um, yes, it is, it is a battery uh, vehicle with a motor. Um, un unlike a conventional bicycle where the chain is connected to the rear wheel and that's what propels the bicycle, in, in my vehicle, 
your pedals are connected to a generation system, which mimics what a bicycle is doing. So you're not connected to the wheel, you're connected to a, a software-driven generator that gives you kind of a, a fly-by-wire experience. Um, and it's, uh, the software manipulates, like I, like I said, the, the amount of pedal resistance. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate that. Uh, I'll, I'll be more specific in my question. Will it move if I'm not pedaling? I guess what I'm wondering is, is that the only way that this thing moves? Mr. Gronfeld. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, Senator, I, I apologize. Yes, it does. It has, it has a throttle. It has a steering wheel with a throttle on the steering wheel that is always available. So you never, conceivably, could never pedal this, and it'll still go. It's basically an electric motorcycle with a pedal generator system mm -hmm. part of it. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And then the other, uh, and I appreciate Senator Rarick asking the question, what is the definition of ultra efficient? That concerns me that there isn't a definition because when we're looking at uh, award grants, you know, applicants need to know, are they within the realm? There needs to be specific definitions if they might even qualify for a potential application uh, uh, grant award. Uh, but the next question I would have is along those same lines though. It says here, one of the other criteria is that Vehicles are near production ready. What is the definition of near production ready? Fair question, Mr. Kronfeld. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator, uh, we have a functional prototype. Um, what we need to do is to uh, complete our R&D for the production <laughs> version and go into production. Uh, what a grant like this would really help a company like mine is to help um, bring about further uh, private investment uh, that would be able to, to see that I have the backing of uh, uh, the state to, you know, to, to help us push to our next goalpost. I think the question is to the definition of near production, if I may, Senator Lucero, that's where you're going? Yeah. I do you want to tackle and, that, Mr. Kronfeld um, or Mr. Senator Chairman, Rest? I would, I would welcome um, either um, uh, help from um, for this bill to be go forward um, at the appropriate time. Help from the Department of Commerce as to what they will consider to be ultra efficient and add a definition at that time, as well as um, a um, a definition of um, um, production uh, ready that will come about not just from uh, um, not just from <clears throat> uh, testimony today, but that would be part of the application um, process. But I, I uh, would agree that a couple of definitions might be um, very helpful in the description here. Senator Rust, Senator Lucero, I'll, I'll give you a, an option here. We have Mr. Kelly in the room. I'm actually done. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and that, option three was you're done. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, Thank I, you, Senator Lucero. I, I think yeah, the point, Mr. Senator Chairman. Rust, is that committee members are asking these questions in an attempt to narrow it down. With that, I had Senator Grunhagen and then Senator Green. Senator Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> yeah, my question is for uh, Mr. Kronfeld. Um, what, per, you know, usually if something's a good idea, from my observation, it attracts private sector investment. And you kind of alluded to it, you're hoping to get this grant to attract private sector investment. But so far, your company, how much private sector, non-government funded money has been attracted to your company to work on this area? What percent? Thank you, Senator Grunhagen. I believe that question's for you, Mr. Kronfeld, mm -hmm. if, you, if you're able to answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Senator. Um, so far, we have had no private investment. Uh, we've had uh, some grants from the state and uh, friends and family investment. Um, uh, but no, we have not had uh, private investment from a, like a venture capital firm. Senator Grunhagen. Yeah, just a quick follow-up. Yeah, you know, what that tells me I, is if it's a good idea, it attracts uh, private capital investment, okay? And uh, so the other thing is, when I look at the recent trend in uh, EVs, I see uh, 
Um, you know, the uh, Tesla stock, this is January 20, January 26, 2024, CNN. It plunged $80 billion in market value, okay, in just a day or so. Then you go to uh, the Chicago disaster. I'm sure you're familiar with it. You can't even charge the cars, uh, and it was only 10 below. It gets much colder here than it does in Chicago. Then you go on top of that, Ford just postponed a 12 billion or canceled a 12 billion dollar investment into EVs. And then you give testimony you have no private sector investment into your company and you're hoping to attract it with this $250,000 based on a, well we hope to get an ultra efficient electric vehicle. I tell you, I just got a lot of skepticism about this, to tell you the truth. So you can respond if you want. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Senator Grunhagen. Uh, Mr. Kronfeld, Senator Rest, if you want to respond. If not, we'll go to the next member. Uh, Sherry, yeah, Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator. Um, this, is a, this is a new area. Uh, the, the, the change over to electric transportation is going to have, uh, pardon the pun, bumps in the road. And, and I'm, not, I'm not surprised at all of, uh, that, that there are these, you know, bumps happening. Um, but I do believe that eventually um, most of our transportation will be electrified as battery technology improves, which it is, and those costs come down, which they are. Uh, I think the, the future of, of transportation, I, I really believe the future of transportation is electric. Thank you. Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And to the testifier, you know, a lot of the questions have already been asked, but I do wonder where are you at now in the process? Because it looks like you got a grant to, through University and Department of Commerce to develop the prototype. I don't know, you know, if there's any private money in there at all yet. Uh, you, you know, you alluded to some of it, but you know, you're going to need a place to start. Do you have a building yet, Mr. Kronfeld? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator. Uh, no, I do not have a building yet. Um, you know, this is this is uh, right now. It's out of my garage. To be honest with you. And, but that's how a lot of businesses get started. Um, and, uh, you know, we, 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 we have been working on it and, and developing it. And uh, we have uh, my, my associate, Ryan Anderson, uh, who is an MIT grad and grew up on a farm in Minnesota is, uh, you know, very competent to, to work with me on, you know, what we need to do to get it done. I, I don't have any reservations about us being able to do what we need to do once we have the, the funding that we get. Um, because we, we built a functional prototype on a very, very shoestring budget uh, of a kind of a vehicle that simply doesn't exist anywhere in the world. Thanks, Mr. Kronfeld. Any follow-up? Just, just one more, um, Mr. Chair, thank you. Do you have uh, any means to move forward if should you not get this grant? Are you going to go forward? Do you have any, any kind of plans, to, or is this is your first stop, or is this your last chance? <laughs> thank you, Senator Green. Mr. Kronfeld. Mr. Chairman and Senator, um, no, it's not. Um, I... Uh, I'm applying for uh, uh, funding through the Department of Energy. Um, that's uh, a process I've begun. And possibly the SBIR program. Um, and uh, I am going to uh, begin uh, approaching, you know, uh, private funding. And I, and I know, I understand that, you know, it's, it's, it's not easy. But you know, n nothing that really is matters is is very easy, and you know this is this is not going to be easy. 
the, the, the fact that we got, we've got to where we are now is, I think, pretty amazing. Um, so, uh, no, this is not my last stop. I'm going to continue to, to work on it. Thank you, Mr. Crump. Uh, mm -hmm. Senator Green, before we go to Senator Mitchell, you're good. Senator Mitchell. Um, I just want to say thank you for doing this. Um, you know, I think Minnesota is known as a state of innovation and technology and in, in amazing ideas that in some cases have changed the world. And so I think for you to take um, your own initiative and time and expertise and help us solve these problems, anyone that does that and then on top of it has to come to present to a panel um, you know, and justify all of that, I, I just really applaud all the work that has gone into you being here today. So thank you for coming here. Thank you for that, Senator Mitchell. Senator Lucero has asked for Thank one you. final opportunity for a brief Thank you, Mr. Comment. Chair. Senator Lucero. And, and you know, along the same lines as Senator Mitchell just said, I also appreciate uh, uh, entrepreneurs, those that take the risk, those that spend the energy trying to innovate, trying to look at where the market is going, look at uh, potential gaps that, that might be uh, non-existent or gaps that are there in, in the market and, and trying to come up with ideas. I, I very much appreciate that. But one of the things that just causes me concern, uh, when, when any entrepreneur or anybody is, is surveying the environment and trying to come up with ideas, and they're going to need money, they need capital, they need investors to come up with their idea. I totally get that. But every entrepreneur is in that same position of needing that capital. I'm always hesitant when that entrepreneur comes to the legislature, a political body, seeking money from, from the government. Because entrepreneurs, and I hope, and I won't ask the question, but I, I, I'm hoping you've done this, is having a similar request to venture capitalists. Making your pitch, there are many venture capitalists out there that after you make their pitch, they, they want to invest if they think it's a good idea, if they're going to get a return on investment. That's where I think some com uh, conversations such as this are more appropriate. But again, I very much appreciate the, the spirit of, of what's being uh, side here. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Senator Lucero. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going to go to Senator Ress for <clears throat> final comments. Again, members, the intention is to lay the bill over. Um, with that, closing comments, if any, Senator Rest. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. I really do appreciate um, the, um, the, the questions and because I, I believe they indicate the interest in, um, in this new technology and um, it certainly is, uh, in my mind, it, it is a um, beneficial uh, use of, um, of public money to encourage um, um, private development and private uh, innovation. And, um, <clears throat> and this certainly, as Mr. Kronfeld said, this is not the last stop. But um, thank you very much for your um, attention and, and your support. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you, Senator Reston. Thank you, Mr. Kronfeld. Um, just thank the you. chair's own uh, last comment. The government does step in at times and try to make decisions on behalf of the public interest. I know some rules we made regarding ethanol in the past. And so with that, I also know some businesses that started in a garage and turned out just great uh, innovation, American virtue. With that, Senate file 4863 is laid over. As amended, Mr. As, Chairman? I was just going to say, Senator Arrest, Senate okay. file 4863 is laid over as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Members, Thank we're you. going to hear from Senator Mitchell on Senate file 4889 next. Senator Mitchell, thank you for uh, appearing before your own committee. Uh, you're here on Senate File 4889, and I understand that you have an author's amendment, the A2. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You read my mind. I would like to move the A2 amendment. Senator Mitchell moves the A2 amendment. Members, any questions to the A2 amendment? Seeing none, all in favor of adopting the A2, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? The A2 is adopted. Senator Mitchell, to your bill as amended. 
Thank you. Um, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I'm pleased to pre present Senate File 4889, which is an RDA request to fund an anaerobic digester, or to fund at least part of it, um, to process food waste in Minnesota. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with the process, uh, anaerobic digestion is where bacteria breaks down the organic matter and from part of that you are able to um, get some natural gas out of that process as well. It's a really um, technologically advanced and I would say even creative way to deal with our waste problem because right now our, our options are usually landfills or burning um, and this is a way to do it more environmentally and also have a byproduct that is useful out of the process. So this money would go toward um, that, building that facility. Um, it is part of how both, I have both representatives from Ramsey and Washington County here with me today, um, and that would be some of the waste from those areas. The amendment, you might have noticed, um, we are changing it from a specific amount to just saying whatever the discretion of the committee would be able to, to do would be wonderful, and there was also a um, where it would be located changed only because where it would go in Louisville Township or Louisville Township uh, is so small that my understanding is there isn't a post office, so it got put in his Shakopee, even though it would be in this neighboring city. So um, just kind of a funny story about how that got through the revisor that way. Um, <laughs> But this would be really meaningful to the community, and if we can get some of the money this year and have ground breaking this year, then it would unlock 300 million in federal funds that could go toward the project as well. So it is a very time of the essence to get this project going. With me here today, I have um, Commissioner Reinhardt of Ramsey County um, and also Commissioner uh, Myron of Washington County, if we could go to the testifiers. Thank you, Senator Mitchell. Well done, as always. Um, commissioners, welcome to the committee. We're hoping for your supportive testimony, maybe two or three minutes if that's manageable. Why don't we start with Commissioner Reinhardt. Um, if you could please introduce yourself and present your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm Ramsey County Commissioner Victoria Reinhardt, and I'm here today on behalf of Ramsey County and the Recycling and Energy Board. This project is the exciting next step in a multi-year effort to get organics out of our landfills and move up the waste management hierarchy. The Recycling and Energy Board is a joint powers board of Washington and Ramsey counties. We've been in partnership for decades, um, and we recently launched an innovative food scraps pickup program to ensure that all the households in both counties, counties wide, have the option to recycle their food scraps easily from home. Organics, such as discarded food scraps, make up 20% of the collected trash. It is imperative that we address this to both remove forward or towards the Minnesota's 75% recycling goal in the metro area and to reduce the greenhouse gases created by landfills. A key limiting factor has been the lack of sufficient infrastructure to process organics into beneficial products. Composting is the traditional method that we are all aware of, but anaerobic digestion, which is pretty much the same as a cow's stomach, um, has the added benefit of producing, producing biogas, like a cow, um, which can be used to produce renewable natural gas. And I'd like to hand it over to Commissioner Miran. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Miron, uh, please introduce yourself and present your testimony. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm Commissioner Fran Miron here today on behalf of Washington County and the Ramsey uh, Washington Recycling and Energy Board. I just want to make sure that you're aware that all of the municipal solid waste from the Capitol here, uh, the state office building, the Senate building here, uh, is processed our, at our facility in Newport, um, which is in Washington County. Um, the, the Recycling and Energy Board has entered into a 20-year contract agreement to provide organics to DEMCON, a facility for processing by anaerobic digestion, and we are committed to pursuing this next level in waste management and renewable energy production for Minnesota. Investment in this facility will produce 75,000 tons per year of new organics processing capacity in Minnesota. The facility will produce 170,000 decatherms or 1.7 million therms of re enough renewable energy and natural gas to heat approximately 4,500 homes annually. 
This will result in a significant reduction uh, of gas emissions, almost 32,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide annually, as compared to if food waste went to a landfill. This is equivalent carbon emission avoided from 7,600 cars annually. Uh, this is a public-private partnership, uh, uh, public between the two counties, uh, the Recycling and Energy Board, and DEMCON, and I want to hand this over now to Bill Keegan, who represents DEMCON, to talk about the specs. Thank you for that, Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Keegan, if you could come forward, please, and then on deck I have Mr. Pranis. Uh, Ms. Fitzke, do you want some help from the pages? Mr. Keegan, we, we have pages that sometimes are able to help. Do you want some uh, tech? Uh, we should be okay. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Chair. Mr. Um, Chair, Senators. Fire I, away. Bill Keegan, uh, President of Demcon Companies. Thank you for having me here today. I'll, I'll make this brief. I know that timing is uh, important. I wanted to give you an opportunity to just tell you a little bit about who Demcon is and what this technology is so we, we understand it. Um, Demcon is a third generation family owned company. We are part of this uh, private public partnership that was mentioned by the commissioners. Um, we are located in Louisville Township, uh, which is near Shakopee. Um, and we have a waste processing, recycling, and disposal campus we call our environmental campus. That consists of a construction demolition, processing and recycling facility, a curbside recycling facility for what you have at your, your curb for the mixed recyclables, uh, shingles recycling, wood recycling, metal recycling, and uh, hopefully soon to be uh, food waste recycling. So this environmental campus is unique in that we are a waste company that embraces landfill diversion, and we've really Really focused on recycling and processing and this this is part of that so we are proposing an anaerobic digester uh, as the commissioner mentioned an anaerobic digester is very similar to your stomach uh, you put food in and you get liquid solids and gases out the gases are renewable natural gas they can be sold into uh, directly into the grid and, and used as natural gas the liquids get incorporated back in the process and the solids uh, are treated uh, essentially through a biochar process to make charcoal. So the solids become charcoal. Biochar, you've heard a lot about. It can be used for a soil amendment or for carbon sequestration. And the renewable natural gas, I've already mentioned, can be used in place of uh, fossil natural gas. Um, it is a modular design. So I think what's unique about this project is it can be expandable. And it's, uh, we just add additional digester units as more interest grows in food waste diversion programs and can be replicated throughout the state. So this is really a chance to have a paradigm shift for Minnesota and move us to uh, additional renewable energy and help us meet our renewable energy and recycling goals. And just in closing, uh, there's a very unique opportunity right now for Minnesota where we've had sort of a convergence of policies both federally and locally. We had the Inflation Reduction Act federally as well as the Natural Gas Innovation Act here locally that have come together and essentially there's a 30% tax credit available for this project. It's a $100 million project, 30% tax credit available from the federal government if there is a shovel in the ground, if the project starts before the end of the year. So the real driving factor is construction has to start by the end of the year. So that, that's kind of where we're at. I guess if there's any questions, I'll um, stand for questions, but thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Keegan. Um, we're going to have our last testifier and then go to member questions, so please stay nearby in case a member has a question for you. Uh, Mr. Pranis, if you could come forward, please. Welcome back to the committee, Mr. Pranis. If you could please introduce yourself and present your testimony. Uh, thank you, Chair Frantz and members of the Senate Energy Committee. Uh, Kevin Pranis, on behalf of Lyuna, Minnesota, North Dakota, represent 14,000 skilled construction laborers uh, across the two states, uh, here to express our strong support for this proposal. I think you've heard plenty about the, the benefits of this in terms of waste management and food waste. Uh, for us, you know, we worked hard, very hard on uh, the Natural Gas Innovation Act, with, which Senator Weber co-authored. I think that's a very important step forward for our gas system in terms of figuring out how to decarbonize while maintaining reliability uh, and affordability on the system. And so renewable natural gas is one of the key options for that. There are several different 
paths forward, including reducing throughput and electrification, but there will be a need for clean fuels. Renewable natural gas is a clean fuel that basically uh, we're talking about eliminating those methane emissions into the atmosphere, which are actually more harmful, and using that instead as a fuel for heating. And so both Excel and Centerpoint are working closely with DEMCON on this, and this is essential to making that plan work. The other thing I would say is uh, this is a chance to use federal tax credit opportunities that we only get if we take advantage of them, they go away. And finally, it's creating high quality jobs and careers for trades uh, that work in this area, folks who want to get into the trades. This is a very exciting project and there could be others like it if it's successful. So I uh, really hope that it uh, gets support from the Renewable Development Account. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Prentice. That's all the listed testifiers I have, Senator Mitchell. Are there any members of the public who wanted to testify on the bill but were not listed? Uh, seeing none, why don't, why don't we go to member questions then? I have Senator Lucero and then Senator Rarick. Senator Lucero. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And actually, my question was going to be for that last testifier uh, who was just up. Mr. Prentice, can you come back? to the testifier's table, please. Oh, I'm sorry. No, testifier before that. I've I'm sorry. Mr. Keegan, can you come go. back to the testifier's table? I can. Mr. Thank Keegan, you. welcome back. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, two questions. The first one is you had mentioned that there are three byproducts, one of them being uh, natural gas. Of the byproducts, not just that one, but of the byproducts, is that enough to cover the cost? Are you making a profit on this? Uh, or is there an, is, do the whatever you can sell the byproducts for, do they not cover the costs? Mr. Keegan. Mr. Chair, Senator, um, great question. The, uh, by the sale of the products from the facility does not cover the cost. Uh, anaerobic digesters are a great thing because they make renewable natural gas, but they have a very large capital expenditure, $100 million. So really to be economically competitive, they need to have effectively uh, grant money, tax subsidies, uh, as well as a tipping fee paid for the food waste coming in. So there's a fee paid as and sell, selling the products. All of that is required to get these to be economically competitive. It's a proven technology. There's 150 of them around the world, but there's only three in the United States. They're all in California, and they have had the similar subsidies to get them to be economically viable. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And okay, I appreciate that. And then, and that was gonna, I think you, you kind of led into my next question, which was gonna be, what is your source? I see here that it's both yard waste and food waste. And for the food waste, then I'm curious, where are your sources? Likely not consumers, I'm guessing. It's probably more commercial uh, uh, sources of, of, of the food anyway, and then the yard waste. Because when I think yard waste, I'm thinking leaves, grass, obviously. And in that capacity, I'm familiar with the, I think the Ramsey County compost site, actually. Uh, I've used that a number of times, and I know there's compost sites all over the place. Is that, would it be diverting from those compost sites then for, for an input here? Mr. Keegan. Mr. Chair, Senator Lucero. Um, yeah, the feedstocks are primarily organic waste being food waste and food scraps, uh, some fats, oils, and greases. Think of your fryer oil or something from a restaurant. Uh, the yard waste that is needed is primarily wood waste because it's needed just for structural content, like eating a little fiber in your diet, right? So that it's needed for structural. It's not really needed for the gas production. So it takes out of the 75,000 tons, or I'm sorry, 75,000 tons that we would process, around 10,000 tons would be yard waste, primarily wood waste. Uh, this does not divert from compost facilities. In fact, one of the project partners with us on this was the Shakopee Midwakanton Sioux community, SMSC. They are building a state-of-the-art compost facility adjacent to our site, and we're working in partnership with them on supply, on operations, and then also on the end products with, with the biochar. The food waste itself comes from residential sources uh, that's collected curbside, as well as what I call front of house and back of house at commercial establishments and restaurants. Back of house being maybe a grocery store sending out off-spec product, front of house being the consumers separating their, their food waste. Thanks, Mr. Keegan. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I, I appreciate that. And again, I, I love innovation. I, I love people that are, are creatively thinking across the, the board in all different areas of our society looking for uh, solutions to, to change the way that uh, things are done now. I'm just concerned, at least right now, that the economics are, it, it, you can't make a profit. So it's going to require, at least as of right now, it's going to require that perpetual subsidizing in order to keep going, right? And if the upfront capital cost is that high, 100 million, I think you said, uh, 100 million dollars, then in the back of my mind, I won't ask any more questions, but the back of my mind is 
the depreciation? What is the life of that $100 million? What is the, the maintenance that is, is required for, for the, the operations for that? Um, just a, a series of questions. But again, I appreciate the, the, uh, the concept and, and again, always trying to be innovative, but financials obviously are a huge rea reality as well. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Lucero. Senator Rarick and then Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, I believe to Mr. Keegan as well. Um, as I was hearing about this earlier, I believe um, it was said that uh, people would put uh, food product into a sortable bag into their regular garbage and that would be sorted out. Um, would that cost uh, also be included in the 100 million, the sorting facility, or is that a completely separate uh, piece? Thank you, Senator Rarick. Um, Senator Mitchell, do you want to tackle that or go to another testifier? I, I would both like to tackle that, but also um, Commissioner Reinhardt has some additional comments. But I will say this is something we're already doing. I, I took a, a tour of the Newport facility over the course of the summer, and so that food waste is already, it's, it's kind of amazing to see. There's like this robotic arm that people put in in a certain colored bag, and the bag, as all the trash goes by, knows that color and grabs it out and is already plucking it out separately. Um, and I will like, would just like to say to trash in general, we have to do something to deal with it and we are going to pay for it one way or the other um, because trash isn't necessarily a profitable business. It's something we just, we produce and we have to deal with and it, is it gonna go in our landfills or what are we going to do with it? So um, those are my comments on the questions and Commissioner Reinhardt. Um, thank you, Senator Mitchell. We're going to go back to Commissioner Reinhardt. I think Senator Rarick's question includes the cost question, savings to counties, et cetera. Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator. I touched on the, the innovative food scrap program that we have. And we have the recycling and energy facility in Newport, Minnesota. It's a partnership between the two counties. Um, and you are absolutely correct. This is from residential as far as what we are doing at the facility. Um, it, there's, you can sign up, it's a voluntary program. We've had really good participation. We've only rolled it out into four cities at this point because going two counties wide is quite a task. So it's gonna take us a while to get it rolled out. Plus we have to have sorting facilities and so forth. But it is as simple as you sign up, you get a year's worth of bags, either six gallon or 13 gallon. You, took, you put your food scraps in it, you throw that into your garbage and it goes to the facility and it's pulled out. The cost of that facility and the tipping fees are really the, probably the most uh, critical. At this point, uh, Ramsey County doesn't subsidize the tipping fees any longer. Those are paid by the hauler who then of course has a cost that's associated with and, and probably passed, I'm sure it is passed on to the consumer. But it is also based on how much you produce. And so we do have the, the tipping fee that will, when we take the the materials from the recycling and energy facility, and they go to DEMCON, then they have a, 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 I can't speak to their tipping fee, but there are fees that are meant to cover those operational costs. I believe the tipping fee right now at our facility is 104. One to one? Okay, $121 a ton. Thank you, Commissioner, that's very helpful. Senator Rarick? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so what is being done right now with that food waste and is this uh, enough uh, to feed the facility or will we need to be expanding and um, having more of these uh, facilities throughout the metro area if we're going to capture um, all of the food waste around Minnesota or of the metro area? Um, Senator Rarick, do you want me to direct that question to Commissioner Reiner? Commissioner, you want to try that or Senator Mitchell? Well, and I think... Uh, Mr. Keegan can also uh, respond to that because the project that they're building is expandable. Um, and yes, we are going to be providing all of that waste to the facility. We believe that what, while what's happening to it right now is that 20% of the stuff that comes into the facility, other than our project that we're working on before that started, um, ends up in the landfill or being incinerated. and. Quite frankly, organics have a negative BTU even in the uh, refuse-derived fuel si uh, system. But we don't want to do that with it either. We've got a useful thing that we can do with this. We can uh, run it through this system, through the anaerobic digester, get usable products out of it, and we deal with the food waste issue. So it's got multiple <laughs> benefits to it. Um, and some of that is financial. 
Thank you, Commissioner. Senator Rarick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I think we're getting close to what I'm getting at. I'm just kind of, again, um, would, the, would your new facility require more of uh, those uh, to get as much into it as you, what you're hoping to be able to process? And again, I'm going to guess that's not then going to be part of the $100 million that we're looking for. Um, that will be additional costs maybe the counties would have to be looking at. Is that accurate? Okay. Mr. Keegan? Mr. Chair, Senator, thank you for the question. Uh, the facility is designed for 75,000 tons of capacity per year. 50,000 tons of that would be coming from Washington Ramsey counties. There are other counties that have expressed interest in processing food waste uh, throughout the metro and outside the metro. Um, so the capacity at this facility would be there uh, as these programs develop. And then as far as adding capacity, you would just add at this facility, just add another modular unit because all of the infrastructure is already there. So adding the modular units is not adding another $100 million or $50 million. It's a, you've already essentially connected to the grid. So it's very easy to add capacity as programs go grow in the metro and around the metro. Thanks, Mr. Keegan. Good for now, Senator Rarick. Senator Dibble. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just first wanted to note that uh, whenever there's any trash talk around here, you can count on Commissioner Reinhardt to be around. <laughs> thank you. She's good at the trash talking. She's the foremost expert uh, in our state, and certainly in our metro area. Um, and uh, I also just wanted to express that I'm, uh, you know, very much in favor of this. This is an important way to deal with our our trash and garbage question. We had the the score funding uh, conversation in front of tax committee yesterday. Again, Commissioner Reinhardt was there with us, making us smarter about solid waste policy. Um, but whenever we talk about uh, renewable natural gas um, and the NGIA, the Natural Gas Innovation Act, um, we just also need to mention that uh, uh, you know renewable natural gas uh, is is a good thing if we're using it to in places where it's going to be hard to electrify in industrial uh, settings, industrial applications, uh, aviation, places like that. Um, it's not necessarily a good thing if we're looking at it as some sort of a replacement for uh, natural gas and, and to the extent that takes us away from beneficial electrification that my friend over here has advocated for um, <clears throat> because uh, there's no way that we're going to be able to generate enough renewable natural gas to, to, to replace fossil fuel or um, uh, originated uh, natural gas. And so, when, you know, if we're using it to slip a little bit of green natural gas into the existing pipelines and distribution system and saying that's some sort of a response to our climate change challenges, that would be a mistake policy-wise, I think. So just wanted to mention that. I think we always need to mention that when we're talking about renewable natural gas. It's not the you know, say-all, end-all, be-all. It's a great application for those hard to electrify sectors, which we're gonna to have to acknowledge are gonna be a while before that ever, if ever happens. Um, but to the extent that we're using it to extend the life of a fossil fuel model that we shouldn't be. And slowing down electrification, that wouldn't be a good policy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Dibble. And, um, you know, thanks for your work on some of the solid waste issues. You got a little shout out from Scott Dibble there, Commissioner. Um, it is no secret that the legislature is looking at solid waste issues, and this is one of the discussions that I'm glad we're having. To Senator Lucero's point, the public wants us to ask questions about cost. Senator Rarick, your questions are right on point, which is, um, of course, we have some climate goals. We have some solid waste management goals. We also have uh, ratepayers who are asking, what's this going to call? What's the tipping fee? Um, I think the legislature is headed to a bigger discussion soon about solid waste management, and my guess is that both of you will be able to testify to that. We have now got an end to the list of questions from members. Um, again, our intention is to lay the bill over. Senator Mitchell, do you have any closing comments before we do that? Uh, thank you for letting us present here today. Again, just reiterating that um, uh, there are other funding sources as well. We're just looking for an, an extra boost from the state if that is possible to add into this. And, and once this is built, then that framework is there. And as other communities uh, take a look at this, then, then it could really benefit more communities around the state once we get this particular site going. Thank you. Senator Mitchell, I think we may have missed a hand online who may have had a question. Um, I'm asking the committee administrator, did Senator Port or McEwen have their hand up? Uh, yes. I think I see Senator McEwen. Senator McEwen, did you have your hand up? And if so, do you want to ask a question or make a comment? 
Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and um, members. I don't want to hold up uh, the this uh, for moving forward right now, but I did have a question that sort of piggybacked a little bit on what Senator Rarick was asking about, and that is um, wondering about the cost um, to the counties and also the capacity, um, both just practical capacity and also financial capacity or absence of capacity um, that the counties have to both collect and deal with uh, food waste to to capture to collect it to divert it. So um, I don't know if there's any more information, but that we could have that would be helpful. But that it piggybacks again on on what Senator Rarick was asking, and then Mr. Chair, what you were alluding to those discussions around cost. And um, I just wondered if the counties had any comment on that. Just could uh, give us just a little bit more information about the county's capacity. Thanks. Thank you, Senator McEwen. And sorry for missing the, uh, the hand being raised. Why don't we give that to Commissioner Reinhart? Um, you know, we're all asking what's the benefit to the counties? What's the benefit to the public? What's the cost? If you have something to Senator McEwen's point, that'd be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator. The, uh, what we use in Ramsey and Washington counties, although our formulas are a little bit different, uh, we do have a solid waste tax that goes on garbage that's being uh, produced. And so that goes on to businesses and to uh, residents. Uh, we also have, and I'll just put in a little uh, added emphasis on the SCORE funding and trying to get that, the Select Committee on Recycling and the Environment and the money that's coming to counties. We put in about four to five times as much into meeting the goals of the state through uh, local funds, through the county. So yes, there is a significant county investment. We take that mandate seriously. And so we are talking uh, millions of dollars. And that's also at the municipal level. To run the recycling programs and uh, to make sure that we get things to market and this is just one of those costs. But I know that in uh, Senator Dibble yesterday, we talked about SCORE funding, and we're trying to get more of that money uh, to help us out. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Members, uh, we're going to lay the bill over. Thank you, Senator Mitchell. Thank you, testifiers. With that, Senate File 4889 is laid over. Seeing the clock, we're going to move on with the agenda. Now we have Senator Port with Senate File 4849. Senator Port, looks like you're out there. I am. Welcome to the committee. Um, I understand that you have an author's amendment, an A1 for this file? I do, Mr. Chair, if I can move the A1, please. Senator Port moves the A1 amendment. Members, it's being handed out now. Any mm -hmm. questions? If not, all those in favor of adopting the A1 amendment, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Senator Lucero, do you have a question? I don't have a question. I have a number of aye votes out there. The chair is going to pause for a second. Any opposed to the A1 say nay. With that, the A1 amendment is adopted. Senator Port to your bill as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, this is Senate file um, 4849, which establishes a program to award grants to political subdivisions, so cities and towns, uh, who are looking to assess the feasibility of installing geothermal energy systems. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty straightforward bill. Um, as cities and towns are having these conversations about whether adding geothermal to their energy resources uh, makes sense. It is a pretty, can be a pretty significant cost to just find out if they are a good fit for that program, if they have the geological conditions uh, required, um, you know, that analysis of the heating and cooling demand of the area that they might be um, looking at and the evaluation of the equipment. So this is a program that would allow up to a $150,000 grant to municipalities um, to be able to just uh, do that, that legwork to assess the risk and see if they're, if geothermal is a good fit for their communities. Um, and then Mr. Chair, I do have a testifier. Thank you, Senator Port. Um, members, we show three testifiers. Uh, first, Willie Mile, then Joe Dammel, then Tina Munson. Um, let's start with Willie Mile. 
please introduce yourself and present your testimony. We're looking for about two minutes, give or take, of testimony, if that's okay. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Chair, friends, and committee members. For the record, my name is Willie Miley. It's, it's not Mile, it's Miley, actually. Uh, I'm the regulatory director at Darcy Solutions. And we're a geothermal company based in New Brighton, Minnesota. We're proud to say that our company grew out of technology that was initially <clears throat> developed at the University of Minnesota. Darcy Solutions created an innovative geothermal system that employs groundwater as a thermal source to achieve significant efficiency gains. Our systems do not consume groundwater, but we simply flow it through an in-well heat exchanger that we design to tap into the vast thermal energy in aquifers. We support this bill because it will help accelerate the widespread adoption of geothermal heating and cooling across Minnesota. This geothermal energy system planning grant program will enable installation of more clean energy HVAC systems in our local government buildings, which will help make progress on the Minnesota Climate Action Framework goals. Many local government units in Minnesota have energy efficiency and decarbonization targets. Counties, cities, and towns across Minnesota manage numerous types of buildings that have different heating and cooling needs. But they all deal with the same issue that building HVAC consumes a lot of energy and uh, in turn costs. Geothermal is the most efficient thermal energy source available for heating and cooling. So it's a great option for local governments to utilize to achieve their energy reduction goals. However, local government staff are typically not very familiar with geothermal systems or evaluating options for renewable energy HVAC. Therefore, this bill benefits local government units by supporting <clears throat> the planning costs associated with geothermal systems so that LGUs, LGU staff can better understand the technology and can determine if it's the right HVAC option for their facilities. In addition, the project planning activities that this bill supports are typically costs that are taken out of the total cost of the final, of the final geothermal system. Uh, thank you for your time today and thank you to the bill author as well. I urge you to please advance this bill and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Mild. Next, we're gonna have Joe Dammel from Fresh Energy and then uh, Councilwoman Munson, I'm assuming after that. Or any other order that you want. Mr. Dammel. Good afternoon and thank you, Chair Friends and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Joe Dammel and I'm the Managing Director of Buildings at Fresh Energy. Fresh Energy is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization based here in Minnesota. And for the past 30 years, we've been advocating for policies to achieve an equitable and carbon neutral economy. And we appreciate the opportunity to testify on Senate file 4849 and want to thank Senator Port for her work uh, bringing this bill to the committee. Uh, this bill establishes a planning grant program to assist communities in exploring the feasibility of network geothermal systems to heat and cool buildings. Network geothermal systems, sometimes, sometimes called thermal energy networks, can be a critical tool to decarbonize Minnesota's building sector. These systems utilize heat energy stored in the ground and can share energy between buildings and users to reach efficiencies of upwards of 500 to 600%. Deployment of these systems at scale could provide affordable, reliable energy to communities across Minnesota. Uh, deployment at scale would also provide family sustaining jobs and reduce the burden on the energy system overall. Today we are in the early days of development of these network geothermal systems and communities need financial support to be able to perform the pre-development work necessary to ensure that these systems would be a good fit for their community. In addition, work funded by this bill would help communities be better prepared to access the unprecedented amount of federal dollars available for installation of these systems. Uh, for those reasons, I urge you to support a Senate file 4849 as amended and, and available for our questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Damo. Um, I hope you'll stay nearby. I know one member has a question for you, but let's finish our testifiers first before we go to member questions. Ms. Munson, you win the Patience Award. Uh, please introduce yourself and present your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Tina Munson, and I'm here today in my official capacity as a city council member for the city of Barton Hills. In full disclosure, I also sit on the Clean Energy Economy Minnesota Board of Directors, and I am also uh, have been at National Grid Renewables, which is a, a renewable energy developer um, and owner-operator. 
I'm here today to support Senate File 4049. To keep it quite simple, small cities like Arden Hills run tight budgets, and doing anything outside of the norm can be high risk or nearly impossible. $150,000 is a lot of money for small cities, and having that funding puts the feasibility of geothermal options within reach. Now, Arden Hills might be a small city, but we're doing really big things on the energy front. The city of Arden Hills, together with Ramsey County, are redeveloping the former TCAP site, also known as Rice Creek, Rice Creek Commons, into a multi-use, walkable, and sustainable community. We have a tremendous opportunity to take advantage of certain unique geothermal characteristics on site, and funding those feasibility studies are key to our overall energy vision of having an all-electric community. Like I said, big things. Rice Creek Commons has another characteristic characteristic we'd like to take advantage of. It has no infrastructure to date, so it's a clean site, which, if you know much about network geothermal, that significantly reduces the capital expenditure costs of when you put it in, when you're already putting in your roads and other uh, utilities and infrastructure. So this bill will open doors for government bodies to consider geothermal, who otherwise may not have considered it. But it will also open the doors for small cities who certainly uh, would not be able to consider it otherwise. I'll take, thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Munson. Um, I believe we have an online testifier. Is there a Katie Kirschbaum who's able to testify online? Yes, I'm with you. Uh, Can thanks. you hear me? Yeah, thank you. Hear you loud and clear, Ms. Kirschbaum. If you could please introduce yourself and present your testimony. Thank you, uh, Chair France and the committee members. Uh, my name is Carrie Kirschbaum. I live in Crookston, and I serve as the Community Development Director working in Northwest Minnesota for the past 14 years to redevelop rural communities and to help them become sustainable. Crookston is home to 7,500 people and with two environmental justice tracks. I'm here today to testify in support of Senate File 48 and 49. Crookston has been facing challenges with heavy tax levies due to inflation and aging infrastructure. And this is particularly impacting our seniors and our vulnerable populations. It was 18% this year. Recognizing the strain on residents with fixed and limited incomes, the community has been exploring alternative energy options to alleviate the financial burden on our residents, particularly focused on weatherization and geothermal solutions in wards with Justice 40 areas and older populations. To pursue this goal, the coalition of organizations, along with our utility company, Otter Tail Power, is called Empower Crookston. It was aimed, <clears throat> excuse me, formed aiming to secure funding through the Climate Pollution Reduction Grant Program in collaboration with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency to implement weatherization projects. However, the geothermal component couldn't be included due to the lack of completed study posing an additional financial challenge for our city. Uh, the, the Crookston EDA supports the Senate File 4849 as it will facilitate access to funding from other state and federal programs to leverage our region's geothermal energy potential, and it would aid in conducting this, the necessary studies, providing a path to implement uh, geothermal solutions, thereby alleviating some of the energy burdens on our residents and promoting accessible, sustainable energy. Other cities are reaching out to me to see how this is going to turn out because they are also interested in the small, these are small rural Minnesota cities with very limited budgets. And so I urge you to support Senate File 4849. Thank you, Chair Friends and committee members for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the bill, and I'm happy to address any questions. But I would also like to just quickly add, we also have um, projects coming up in 2027 where when we open up the ground for, for new infrastructure down there, if we were able to get this geothermal in at the same time, it would be great for the economy of scale. So I think many of us are in the same boat with that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Kirschbaum. That's all our listed testifiers. Are there any members of the public who are here who want to testify to the bill? Seeing none, we're going to go to member questions. Uh, Mr. Dammel, my question is uh, for you, which is basically Fresh Energy's take on the um, Excel territory limitations and how it might apply to the language in this bill. Yep. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, for the, for the question. I think um, you know the, the language in the bill is intended to ensure that communities across the state can have access to these planning grants. We understand too the, the limitations of using RDA money. We think that, you know, Excel does have service territory across the state, it's not across the entire state. And we think that the, uh, you know, in initial findings from the results of these planning grants uh, will be instructive for reaching more and more parts of the state over, uh, over the, the coming years. Fair enough, thank you. Took my best shot. Members, are there any other questions? Senator Weber. 
thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, geothermal is not a new idea. It's been around for decades. Um, and I know people that installed it in their, for their system 20 years ago. Um, I think uh, over the years uh, we've seen geothermal go from a from a, a very land needy situation with the installation of the piping to a much reduced landscape where they're drilling down and and uh, what have you. Um, I guess I question the need for our communities. Uh, to have this. I, I, there's, there are a variety of sources of information out there. Uh, there are many elements, I think, that go into the uh, restriction or inability of it to be utilized, whether it's land area, whether uh, it's, it's service territory, as, as you mentioned, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess I question the uh, overall benefit of granting money in this capacity. If someone would like to address that for me, please. Thank you, Senator Weber. Uh, Senator Port, uh, do you want to try to respond to that or do you want to designate a testifier who might give it a shot? I will, I'll start, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you for the question, Senator Weber. You know, I think as we have set pretty aggressive goals um, that we absolutely need to have our communities meet across Minnesota. Um, geothermal can be one of those things that helps bridge that gap for communities that might not have, um, you know, the infrastructure or um, we don't have the technology to get all the way there um, to meet their goals. And we want to make sure that our communities our local cities and towns, as they are thinking about how they're going to reach their goals, have the full slate of opportunities in front of them. And you're absolutely right, geothermal is not new, um, but it does have a cost associated with doing the study and finding out if your community is a, a viable location for geothermal. And so this is to help sort of eliminate uh, or at least reduce that cost of just checking and finding out if this is an option for your city, which could greatly open the doors to um, you know, learning that it is. And that is where uh, there's a lot of federal money available as well to help actually input these systems um, at that point. And then I wonder if the councilwoman um, has additional remarks. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Senator Port. Uh, Councilwoman, if you have any brief additional comments to Senator Weber's point or concern. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Weber. I'll just respond that doing anything different on a, on a local government level is really hard. I have, an, I have vast experience, both academically and professionally, on the energy industry, and it is very hard, even with somebody with my background, to do something that I'll call different even if it is an older technology. And so if you can ever, if you can remove that friction of risk, running risk of spending the money on a feasibility study as well as um, removing the funding hurdle itself, uh, you create a pathway for people to just quite simply review and, and have all the options on the table much like Senator Port said today. Thank you. Senator Weber. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I served 16 years in local government and actually we ran a municipal electric uh, department. Um, in actuality, we were constantly uh, pursuing different technologies and what have you, um, and and I don't think it's all that hard if you have a community uh, or governing board uh, that's dedicated to finding the best uh, way to deliver uh, product and service. And what I really get concerned with is we spend a lot of money in our different programs up here, uh, whether it's RDA, whether it's uh, uh, the other uh, elements that are out there, uh, legacy funds, et cetera, to produce studies that wind up being in a drawer somewhere and never really accomplish anything. And that's what bothers me uh, with providing money for another set of studies. And uh, because I do believe uh, the industry itself has amassed a great deal of information that's available to communities if they really want to pursue it. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Weber. 
members other questions before we go to the author for final comments it is our intention to lay this bill over as well seeing none senator port any final closing comments thank you mr chair um and you know just to that last comment i want to be clear that this is not for a study to understand if geothermal works or how geothermal works it's to do a specific feasibility study for the location and the needs of a community um, and to prepare for you know building out that whole system just like we do with roads and bridges we do a study before um, the essentially the planning process um, so just wanted to clarify that um, otherwise I appreciate the committee's time and I think this is a great resource to help our local communities uh, be able to get over this first hurdle to uh, figure out if geothermal works for them Thank you very much for those comments and for presenting the bill. Senator Port, with that, Senate File 4849 is laid over. Thank you to the testifiers. We'll now go to Senate File 4686. Senator McEwen, hopefully you're still there. I am, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you. I understand you have an author's amendment, the A2. Would you like to yep. have us offer that? Yes, please, Mr. Chair. Senator McEwen offers the A2 amendment. Any discussion to the A2? Seeing none, all in favor of adopting the A2 say aye. 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 All aye. opposed? The A2 is adopted. Senator McEwen to Senate File 4686 as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, uh, last session, this committee and the legislature took important steps toward reducing our state's greenhouse gas emissions across a wide array of areas. We passed a 100% requirement for our power utilities and provided an array of support for individuals and businesses to reduce their emissions. This included a rebate program for the purchase and installation of air source heat pumps. However, at the time, we did not provide direct support for building owners that wish to install geothermal heat pumps. Senate file 4686 as amended would do just that. As members of this committee are well aware, geothermal heat pumps use the relatively constant temperature of the earth to capture underground heat in the winter and use it to heat buildings. In the summer, the reverse process is used and heat is taken out of our buildings and sequestered underground. Geothermal heat pumps are a carbon-free and efficient way to heat and cool our buildings. Because they remain efficient, even when it is very cold out, they also provide benefits to the grid avoiding some of the need for extra transmission and generation investments. Additionally, geothermal heat pump installation has the potential to create significant new good paying job opportunities for skilled construction workers. In the past year, we have seen significant interest build in large geothermal heat pump installations from school districts, cities, including Duluth, nonprofit organizations and developers. While geothermal heat pumps can save building owners money over the life of the investment, they have a higher upfront cost than traditional furnaces or air source heat, heat pumps. This rate rebate in combination with federal tax benefits through the IRA will help building owners get over that initial cost hump and deploy geothermal heat pumps. As members of the committee can see, we have made a number of changes to the original legislation through the amendment that we have just adopted. These include uh, giving, um, given the more limited funds that we have available this year, we have targeted the program to larger multifamily and commercial building. Hopefully in future years, there will, there will be more funds available to expand the program to residential buildings. Um, but as of now, we are targeting the program. Uh, we have prioritized funding for government and nonprofit organizations, as well as low income housing. And we have increased the rebate to 10% of the project cost capped at $100,000. This was based on feedback around what would be a meaningful enough incentive. And with that, uh, Mr. Chair, that concludes my opening remarks and I, I will stand for questions. I believe we have also some testifiers for the bill. Thank you, Senator McEwen. We do have a list of testifiers. Uh, so Charles Sutton first, Willie Miles second, Mr. Sutton. Mr. Mile, if you want to come forward. 
Mr. Sutton, welcome back to the committee. We're hoping to keep our testimony in the two-minute range. If you could please introduce yourself and present your testimony. Thank you. Chair, friends, members of the committee, uh, my name is Charles Sutton. I'm here uh, today on behalf of my client, GeoExchange, a trade organization representing the geothermal heat pump industry. Geothermal heat pumps are an efficient, climate-friendly way to heat and cool homes and buildings. Because they use the constant temperature just under the ground as a heat source, they remain efficient even in some of the coldest temperatures. This benefits the individual business owners, uh, but as uh, Senator McEwen alluded to, it, it can also provide some of those grid benefits uh, as well as some resiliency. Geothermal uh, heat pumps can be installed in both residential and commercial sized buildings. Uh, you know, we'd like to thank Senator McEwen for introducing SF4686, uh, which will provide meaningful support to business owners who wish to install geothermal heat pump systems in their building. Well, as she alluded, you know, while these can save building owners money uh, on both heating and cooling costs over the life of the, pro of the installation, uh, that upfront cost can be a challenge for individual business owners. Uh, this uh, rebate will help leverage some of the federal funding available through the IRS. Uh, to support the deployment of geothermal. Thanks for the opportunity to testify uh, and I encourage members to support the bill. Thank you, Mr. Sutton. Uh, Mr. Miley, before you testify, we're open for a couple minutes, but you do not have to rush through it um, if you don't need to. I mean, we want the right testimony to the bill. Mr. Miley. Thanks again, Chair, friends, and committee members. <clears throat> for the record, my name is Willie Miley. I'm the regulatory director at Darcy Solutions. We support this bill because this geothermal heat exchange system rebate program will enable installation of more clean energy heating and cooling systems, which will help make progress on the Minnesota Climate Action Framework goals. We're now on an impressive path in Minnesota towards decarbonizing electric generation, but building HVAC systems are a large emission source, accounting for approximately 12% of total energy consumption across the economy. And building heating systems are particularly challenging to electrify. One significant challenge is that widespread use of primarily electric heating systems would put significant strain on the power grid during peak times. However, utilizing geothermal energy for building HVAC addresses this problem with the most efficient thermal energy source available. Building HVAC needs are unique and decisions on HVAC system modifications to increase efficiency and reduce carbon emissions need to be made by each individual building owner. A similar rebate program already exists in Minnesota for air source heat pumps. So by also providing rebates for geothermal systems, Minnesota building owners will have more options to utilize a renewable HVAC system that makes the most sense for their particular building. Thanks again for your time today and thank you to the bill author. I'll take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Miley. Let's finish up our testifiers members before we go to questions. With that, Mr. Pollard, welcome back to the committee. Please introduce yourself and present your testimony. Thank you, Chair Friends, members of the committee. My name is John Pollard. I'm the political director for the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 49, the state's largest construction union. Our union represents heavy equipment operators who build infrastructure across the state of Minnesota in all sectors, including the energy sector. Our members perform construction and maintenance work on traditional thermal energy plants, but also on wind and solar power systems. We also build and maintain the natural gas distribution system that almost two thirds of our Minnesota neighbors rely on to heat their homes and run their appliances. As the state looks to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the building sector, geothermal heat pumps are a promising option and one that will create good jobs for our members. We also appreciate the inclusion of a preference for projects that utilize registered apprenticeship programs. Registered apprenticeship programs remain the gold standard in workforce training and are an important component of training the next generation of skilled construction workers. We'd like to thank Senator McEwen for bringing the bill forward and appreciate member support. Thank you, Mr. Pollard. With that, we'll have Mr. Dave Wager Come forward, Mr. Wager. Welcome back to the committee. If you could please introduce yourself and present your testimony. Hoping for a couple minutes, but with plenty of flexibility to allow people to say what's on their mind. Mr. Wager. No problem. Mr. Chair, members, I'm Dave Wager, Executive Director of the Minnesota Propane Association. I'm here to speak in opposition to Senate File 4686. Our concern is that this bill does not promote energy reliability and security. We will need various clean energy options and meter goals and propane for provide solutions. The, the proponent strategies may make clean domestic fuels like propane expensive or unavailable. We must assure that reliability and cost are factors in any conservation decision. Last week I testified on a report from the North American Reliability Corporation about generation concerns with the grid and the consequences of our actions. 
A recent report from the Midwest Reliability Organization reached a similar conclusion about the dire state of grid reliability. For the first time in their history, they identified an extreme risk, uncertain energy availability. Following this report, a quote was released from Minn Kota Power Cooperative. Reliability needs to stay at the forefront of people's minds as a policy framework is being defined, said Mac McLennan, CEO. It's unacceptable, unacceptable for the people in our region to wake up in the morning and not know if they're going to have dependable electric service. Our country is accelerating down a path where this could become a reality. We need to approach this transformation of America's electric grid with caution and common sense. There's simply too much at stake, end quote. The grid reli reliability report from the Energy Information Administration states that in Minnesota from 2021 to 2022, the customer average minutes of interruption increased by 127 percent and the average length of outage increased by 96 percent. Propane is an important part of our energy mix with many benefits. Propane is 73 percent hydrogen and it's also listed as a non-pollutant that doesn't harm air, soil, or water. According to the EPA, propane is almost three times more efficient than electricity. Propane is stored on site, making it less vulnerable to reliability issues. We also need to consider the improvements of propane no different than we're considering the improvements of electricity. Renewable propane is being used in the United States today. Its carbon intensity is as low as 20 and it is decreasing. Renewable propane blends with conventional propane at any percentage, meaning no new infrastructure, no new equipment, no new appliances are needed. Minnesotans, especially rural Minnesotans, need reliable energy and access to all forms of energy at an affordable price. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for allowing me to testify. Thank you, Mr. Wager. Um, that's the end of our listed testifiers. Are there any members of the public who are here who wanted to come forward and testify on the bill? Seeing none, um, no hands up online. Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just some of the testifiers uh, anyone can answer it if, if they want, but can you give us a breakdown? Uh, because, you know, people tend to believe that when you put in the geothermal, all of a sudden your, elect your uh, heating bills go away. They do not. So it's electric heat. In our area, like, like the gentleman stated, the propane is very important to us. We, uh, we can't even get full electric heat through our uh, co-ops unless we have a backup. That's how unreliable that is. And now you're going to put this in, it's going to cause a huge draw on the electrical system. What is the difference in electrical usage from uh, regular electric heat uh, switching over to, to uh, geothermal? Do you have those numbers? Thank you, Senator Green. Uh, Mr. Wager? <clears throat> I'm, I'm a propane guy. I can't answer an electrical question. What I, what I can answer is uh, I sit on the... Energy Advisory Policy Committee for the LIHEAP program. And so every year we look at energy costs. And right now we're looking at the average electricity prices going up 2% on an annual basis, where propane is predicted to stay flat and trending down. Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, well, I get, don't get an answer to that, but I can tell you from my own experience, it does drop a little, but it's not that much. And I like my geothermal very much. But uh, I don't know uh, how many years it's going to take me to get a payback for it. Uh, but we've got these rebates. So the next question is, uh, you, you mentioned federal leveraging federal funding. Now, there are rebates for putting in uh, electric heat or geothermal now. Uh, do you know what they are and, and uh, how this is going to compare to that? Or is this going to be added on to it or subtracted from it? Senator Green, um, do you want any particular testifier to try to... Whoever can that? answer it. I see Mr. Sutton returning to the testifier table. Mr. Sutton, is that a sign you'd like to give an answer? Uh, yeah. Uh, Fire away. Chair uh, uh Senator Green, yeah, so the, the, I, or the federal tax credit through the IRA is, is, at, is at 30%. Um, it, there are some adjustments that can go upwards uh, for, uh, depending on sort of the location and some of the other conditions, but that's sort of the base credit is a 30%, and this would, be, this would be additive. So, Thank you, Mr. Sutton. Why don't you stay right there, Mr. Yep. Sutton. Senator Green. Mr. Chair, so the 30%, is that for all geothermal, or is that for commercial? Because this, this bill is dealing with commercial... Uh, in a sense, or, or is that for residential? Mr. Sutton. Stumped him. It's commercial no. also. 
so that's that's commercial also. So it's it's thirty percent for residential, and then I believe again thirty percent. But there are some ways in which it can be added based on sort of the location. Um, there's some additional bumps essentially to the credit. I don't know if you want to speak. Senator Green, do you need more? Uh, is that a no? no I'm good, okay, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to go to Senator Hoffman. Mr. Chair, thank you. Eleven years ago, there was this conversation around this table about solar, right? Get the, the effects of solar. And solar, we need to do solar. And then, then uh, Speaker Hortman was the chair of uh, energy over in the House. I said the House, sorry. In the other body. And over here, it was uh, John Marty who was the chair. And in the conversation, there's a few people in this room that were part of this conversation. It led to a thing, Mr. Chair, about solar gardens. Remember that, Scott Dibble, the Senator Dibble on the solar gardens? And the same, it's almost like the same, I'm almost, you know, what's that movie? What's that ground, what's that movie? Help me out here. There it is, Groundhog Day. This is like I'm having the conversation over again. And the question is, I, I love this, is you got $4 million set in there, but there's no means test stuff in there. It's like, are we going to have the same? Because here's, and I remember this conversation when we did this, Mr. Chair, is when solar gardens were having it, who was able to afford and take advantage of this program, right? I'm not going to say the name of the companies, but there's one in downtown St. Paul, and they got a big, tall building, and they had all these beautiful solar panels on there, right? Um, they were able to do that. But the average Joe at the time, from the original bill, it was like, all right, lessons learned. And this is my point as we have this conversation, lessons learned. Where is the measure of income against the federal poverty line, right? Where is this means test that could possibly be in here? Because you got $4 million. I'm not seeing it. If I'm not seeing it, maybe it's because I'm trying to see it and I'm not seeing it, but yet I'm feeling I'm in this movie. And Bill Murray keeps saying, good morning. Thank you, Senator Hoffman. I think uh, that's a very legitimate question. Why don't we do this? First of all, um, to the author of the bill, uh, any, any comment or response? Um, I, I guess I, I'm not really sure why we would want to see means testing in something like this. There's a whole criteria for um, how these would, would be set up and applied means testing really isn't necessarily the point here because what we really want to do is contribute to having clean energy for our buildings overall. Um, if there are some adjustments that Senator Hoffman would like to see, my door is always open. I'd be happy to discuss those with him. Um, but I'd also like to see if any of our experts who've joined us uh, to, to testify have any um, comment or um, opinion on that issue. Thank you. Appreciate that, Senator McEwen. I think we're always open to conversation. Members, we do want to move on to the next bill, but if there's a testifier at the table who wants to tackle that particular question, we'll have that. Otherwise, we're going to go ahead and table the bill with the pledge from the author, Senator Hoffman, to engage further. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I think what, what the, the author of the bill should really engage is the people that lessons learned on this, right? Um, I use the term means testing because of the fact Everybody thought they were doing the right thing, but then there was unintended consequences. And those folks that should have gotten it, and I know the, the, the author wants to get people to make sure they have it, but I'm seeing a gap. And whenever I see a gap, there's usually means there's a gap there. And I'm questioning. It's more of a question. Don't have an answer because I'm not an expert, but I can point to about four people in this room that are watching this hearing that I know were there who probably have some good ideas on this. You want me to name who you guys are or not? So, no, no, no. All no, right, no. thank you. Um, Maybe I, she should be talking to them because they were here 10 years ago when we were having the same conversation. Appreciate that, Senator You're good. Hoppen, um, and I'd also think we want to ask a few more questions rather than a few less in the committee. Um, with that, Mr. Sutton, I think we do need to move on on our agenda. Um, if you have a very brief comment, we'd be happy to take it at this point. Chair friend, Senator Hoffman, I can, just, I can point to just two quick things, and they're not quite a means test, but there is a uh, preference, one for, uh, I think, or it's for environmental justice communities, which includes uh, low-income areas, and then there's also a preference for uh, low-income housing as well. So not a means test, like you said, but there are uh, some preferences in the bill, uh, I think, you know, leaning towards that, uh, that issue of ensuring that we're directing funds towards those that uh, most need them. Mr. Sutton, thank you for keeping that brief. Um, Senator McEwen, any closing comments before we lay the bill over? No, I think just uh, thank you very much for hearing the bill, and um, hopefully we're going to get some of these geothermal projects um, 
initiated and moving forward um, with um, some speed. Thank you. Appreciate that very much, Senator McHugh. And with that, Senate File 4686 is laid over. Thank you to the testifiers. Final bill, members on the agenda, is Senate File 4685. Senator Housley's bill, I believe, being presented by Senator Gustafson. And since Senator Gustafson's approaching the testifier table, I must be right. Senator Gustafson, welcome to the Energy Committee. Two-year bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. And yes, I want to say thank you to Senator Housley, who is actually the chief author of this bill, um, as well as uh, co-authors are myself, Senator Mitchell, and Senator Duckworth. Um, the Wildlife Rehabilitation Center is seeking $2 million from RDA in support of significant sustainability features in its planned new wildlife rehabilitation facility in the city of Grant. Um, WRC's mission, uh, Wildlife Rehabilitation Center, is to provide quality medical care and rehabilitation for all sick, orphaned, and injured wild animals and to provide professional education to those who care about wild animals. In the last decade, demand from the public for their services, WRC, has grown nearly 50% with annual patients of nearly 20,000. The WRC is one of the busiest wildlife hospitals on the globe. They set the global standard for wildlife medicine we think the new rehabilitation facility uh, should set the standard for environmental protection as well. The new $13.5 million facility will be recognized as the blueprint for future wildlife hospitals worldwide. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And when you're ready, we have a testifier. Thank you, Senator Gustafson. Our testifier is Mr. Phil Jenny. Mr. Jenny, welcome to the committee. If you could please introduce yourself and present your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Phil Jenny. I'm the retired executive director of the Wildlife Rehabilitation Center of Minnesota. Uh, I retired after 21 years as the ED to devote all my time and energy to lead this project. Uh, Minnesota is known for innovation and a strong commitment to natural resources and the environment. And we believe this new wildlife facility sets a standard for sustainability while at the same time improving our uh, veterinary care for injured wild animals. Um, WRC was founded in 1979 as a student organization of the University of Minnesota's College of Vet Medicine. We became a separate nonprofit organization in 1996, but stayed on the vet school campus until building our own wildlife center in Roseville in 2003. And as Senator Gustafson said, we've had explosive growth. Uh, our admissions have grown nearly 50% since 2019 alone. And we also last year uh, delivered about 12,000 hours of uh, global instruction on wildlife medicine to places all over the world. We just, one of our vets just got back from Dubai after uh, teaching there. Uh, th this growth has made us, as uh, Senator Gustafson said, the largest, busiest wildlife hospital in the world. Uh, but it also has put great pressure on our facilities. We're out of room in our Roseville Hospital. And in 2019, we purchased a 22-acre farm in Washington County to provide space and less human contact for injured and orphaned wild animals. In 2022, our board of directors approved the construction of a $13.5 million sustainable facility on this new Grant campus. Um, you might not know it, but medical facilities of, uh, of all kinds uh, face tremendous challenges with uh, waste management, excessive water use, and energy. Uh, and managing these issues is complicated in areas of unique natural beauty, such as the St. Croix Valley and the Rice Creek Watershed District, where groundwater issues have been intensifying. We are essentially building our own water treatment plant. It will include 56 in-ground pools that when filled will contain 165,000 gallons of water. 
Wastewater in those pools is drained, filtered, and recycled every day, which means that over the course of a year, we will conserve and recycle 37.5 million gallons of water that would otherwise have been either uh, taken from the aquifer or removed through uh, wastewater runoff. Our design has already been approved by wash the, the watershed district, the state, the county, and the city of Grant. Uh, our, our plan also features uh, installing a geothermal system, uh, which incorporates technology developed at the University of Minnesota and already mentioned here, designed by local company Darcy Systems. Now, it's true that uh, geothermal has been around for a long time, but Darcy is the latest technology. It's quite different than the old systems, and our system was highly recommended by our own uh, lead energy and sustainability uh, partners. Um, we also are working with another Minnesota company, Apadana Solar, to bring their latest solar technologies uh, to our project. And our panel, solar panel system will save about two and a half million pounds of CU2. Um, we are committed to protecting not only Minnesota's birds and uh, animals, but also the environment in which we live. Now, while our uh, flagship vet clinic is in Roseville the, and the proposed rehab center is in Grant, we provide statewide services. Uh, last year, more than 12,000 members of the public brought uh, animals to us, um, and those people came from half of the state's 87 counties. Um, so people come from all over. We're also an important partner for the Department of Natural Resources, the Department of Health, and the University of Minnesota and other organizations on issues ranging from disease surveillance, sampling collections, and public education. And perhaps most uh, is really the intangible part. WRC fosters a culture of hope, compassion, and kindness. It, rescuing a wild animal is uh, a really a portal to the larger concern for the world. Uh, this is a high leverage project. The request is just 15% of the total. We already have significant public support with a lead gift of $5 million, and we expect a broader public campaign as we get closer to groundbreaking. The project is shovel ready and will begin as soon as the money is available. Uh, it's a unique project that speaks directly to Minnesota values, and uh, I hope that we can uh, count on your support. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Jenny. Um, any members of the public who wanted to testify on this bill who are not on the list, seeing none, any member questions before we lay Senate file 4685 over, going once, going twice. Senator Gustafson, would you or on behalf of Senator Housley like to make any final comments before we lay the bill over? Thank you, Mr. Chair, committee members. Um, no, just say thank you for considering our request. Well done, Senator Gustafson. Well done. With that, Senate file 4685 is laid over. Uh, members, we have no further business. We will not be meeting, of course, on Monday, April 1st, but we will be back Wednesday, April 3rd. That is an informational hearing on the right of first refusal. With that, the Senate Energy, Utilities, Environment, and Climate Committee is adjourned.